Hey, welcome to Guitar Knobs, the guitars, gear, noise, and nonsense podcast hosted today by these knobs. Tony Dudzik, Pick Guardian. Billy Spitfire, oh. Billy Spitfire Unlimited. Yeah. It's like you're coming up for air there. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Hey, everybody. It's me, Todd Novak. <laughs> Welcome to the Guitar Knobs Podcast. We're thrilled to death uh-huh. that you are listening <laughs> to our show. Uh, we are in our seventh year of production, everybody. Wow. Yeah. Seven years of glory. Seven years. Lucky seven. Here we go. I'm knocking on wood to not screw that up. Yeah. Billy, what do we do on the show? We talk about <laughs> time for redemption. <laughs> G- g- boutique builders yes of fine gear that's right that's and tony what else well you know we like to find the story behind the story from the movers and shakers in this fine world of musicality that's right and we've got a great one that we met at nam this year who, that we just referenced we actually talked about this person oh yeah we're gonna still episode. speak in third yeah, person until he reveals himself <clears throat> Uh, and so we had a nice little chat about that. But person, reveal yourself. Well, I mean, you know, tell us who you are. Sorry. <laughs> hey, Barry from Grez Guitars here. Awesome. Well, uh, we had a lovely time talking with you when we were uh, at NAM and discovering, you know, the funnest thing is when you walk in, you're like, whoa, what's this? And that's exactly what happened to both Billy and I and no doubt uh, thousands of other people that uh, graced your booth. So we're going to have a great discussion about these guitars. In the meantime, where can people find the guitars that you make? Uh, let's see. Uh, Grez Guitars, G-R-E-Z, guitars.com. Obviously the website and Instagram, Facebook, tiny bit of TikTok. And uh, wow. um, yeah, some dealers spattered around the country as well. Fantastic. You can find on the website. Fantastic. Uh, I think you have a unique offering in the guitar world, at least we think so, and that's why we wanted to talk to you about it. So we're going to get into that more a little bit later. Tony, I like your hoodie. It's an old school uh, NYC. This is an old, uh, yeah. old, old, old Navy. Yeah, but the, hoodie. The, mostly the NYC part. NYC. Yeah, pretty kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so without further ado, oh, and by the way, uh, Barry, where are you calling from today? A uh, little town called Petaluma, California, uh, about a, about 45 minutes north of San Francisco, Beautiful. up in the countryside. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful area up there. Northern, northern California. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're pinned between the coast and the wine country. Yes. Oh, it is wow. lovely. You know, Big one trees, of my favorite redwoods. things to do, anytime that anybody goes, they say, oh, I'm going to California. I'm like, where about there? Oh, kind of San Francisco and up north. And I was like, every single person I say... And you, I'm sure you've, you're familiar with this. If you're not, I will be shocked. Um, in an area called Willits. <laughs> I know Willits. Okay. One of my greatest memories. So living on the coast, if you live on the West Coast, kind of like you're kind of, you're kind of bound to the West Coast because anything else is you might as well go to Japan. Even if it's, you know, if you're crossing the Rockies, it's like that's a real uh, ordeal, especially like when I was growing up. Um, so it was our vacations were car trips up and down the coast. And at one point in time, we went up to Willits and there's a fort there and you, you, uh, you can either go via the fort or go in, uh, through the actual forest area, but there's a very slow steam train, a logger train (laughs) called the skunk train Ah. that, that runs the river logging route through the, uh, through the forest and it is it's it's just there's no it's there's no other experience like it's just it is a unique thing all its own and it is beautiful and it is um how slow is it it's pretty slow like uh five miles an hour i don't know miles an hour slow on trains it's slow it's not you know kilometers an hour you get there i don't know (laughs) I don't know train speeds, man, <laughs> but it's it's slow and it's open car, so you, ah. you can. There's closed car and there's open car. So in the open car, you're. I mean, you're right on the cliff. You're looking down and it's beautiful rivers going doing the thing, and you're. You know, and, oh, it's great. Wow, 
So I, I encourage everybody. I said, like, please, please, please go experience that because it's like the only place in the entire country that you can really have that experience. Skunk train. Yeah. I'm going to write that down. Yeah. Is it that's still run? I don't know. Maybe I, yeah, I know you're not the board of tourism far, over there. But. Right. As far as I know, it's still going, which is a little surprising. But yeah, it's it's been going forever and uh, it gets you deep in the heart of the Redwoods. It's amazing, mm -hmm. isn't it? I love it. Um, anyways, and you know what's crazy? It was when I was a kid, I had um, uh, it, you get to when you go on trips and stuff, you always try to get your parents to get souvenirs we didn't have a lot of money so and souvenirs were never really a thing that we got <laughs> but i managed to save up my um taking out the trash money and all that stuff and i got a tiny little like pirate cap gun i kind of had a little collection of them and i was like <laughs> pew 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 and this branch knocked it out of my hand i was like the saddest boy and Aww. you lost it on, lost the skunk it on the skunk train oh no <laughs> yeah but nah. but to prove how great it was, I was like, doesn't matter. This is the best. So yep. nah. anyways. <laughs> so same here. We did not have a lot of money growing up. And on uh, somewhere I have a box of all the, you know, the pennies that you put in the little machine that smashes it and makes a design oh, yeah. on them. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's that was our souvenir. I think it cost a dime at that time or 15 or 20 cents. And then you put a penny in and then you got a penny out. Yeah. So that's cool. Yes. A um, little bit of uh, narration here. Billy is actually going to be, he's working on a little thing here. We, in the past, we referenced how we got the Duesenberg trim and then the generic, I guess, eBay trim oh, yeah. version of that. And um, so he's got two of the exact same, roughly exact same model guitar yeah, here. Pretty close. They're both Reverends. And they're both, uh, what, what model is this, Billy? They're exactly the same model. This is a Charger 290? The, the, yeah, t we've got two Charger 290s here. And he's got a Duesenberg on one, and he's going to put the uh, eBay version on the other one. And we're just going to see which one is better. There's like a, I guess about a $40, $50 price difference. Mm -hmm. It's not the worst thing in the world to have that price difference, but, you know, just chicken, you know? So you, you'll hear a little bit of background kerfuffle, um, but... Um, Bear with, bear with us while we're under construction. <laughs> the mod shop is open. Yeah, yes. exactly. All right. So, anyways, uh, I wanted to call out. Uh, we've got a brand new executive producer. Love it, David Tyndall. Uh, we're guessing we're we're going with Tyndall. A uh, slightly uh, more weighted A on that one. Would yes. you say? Yeah, because it's a D A L L. D A L L. Yes. Anyways. As with everybody that signs up, we ask him a couple questions. And uh, ten, uh, David, I'll, I'll call him by his actual <laughs> first name. He's a grown man. Um, he said, uh, oh, I play a lefty American pro strat two. Ah. Or a pro strat. Uh, and he with a smiley face because he knows. Right up your alley, I'm not, Todd. I'm not a strat guy. Um, but lefty. Oh, yeah. Got a. That's that's one more out there. Yeah. It's not too many. Um, he uh, Stomp XL. Through a Bugera V22. He said the laughs and team cohesiveness uh, is what basically got him hooked. Yeah. And um, he says, uh, he, uh, I'm a retired army that door dashes for capital GAS money. <laughs> and at first I was like, dude, that's kind of sad. He was like, you know, for gas money. Oh, wait, gear acquisitions. Yeah. Yes, and so he's got the FIVA. He's got the FIVA. Uh, anyways, he's, um, let's see, uh, uh, he was searching for the apps and, and, uh, felt it was time to return the favor. You guys have brought many hours of joy, laughter, and interviews to, into my laugh, into my life, life, probably, maybe. I haven't thought about making up a would you rather, uh, maybe I will think about it whilst, and at the same time, yes, on my countless hours driving. So, Thank you, David, for joining yeah. our group. We're really excited. Welcome aboard. We'll get some awesome reward package out mm. to you, okay? We need to find out what's going on in our music worlds this week. We're going to start out with the lovely, mm. the wondrous, yes. the bespectacled, yes. and besmirched Tanya Bolonsky sitting across from me, and then we're going to check in with Barry. Yeah, that sounds like a fair plan. Will we talk to, to Billy, too? We will. Oh, yeah. And then you'll, you'll have something to talk I'll have about? I'll something, too. Okay, good. I just didn't want to do it all by myself. 
<laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So uh, this week, um, <laughs> I'm gonna. This is gonna be a gripe week because I am just disgusted with the price of paint. I like house paint. No, well, colors, I'm talking about the paint, paint I use at the shop. I use automotive. I use automotive lacquer. Uh, and that's mainly for guards that I cut out of clear paint. and I shoot. Well, there's some similar oh. things in there that I shoot on the backside, uh, kind of like old Gretsch guards or Rickenbacker guards and that sort of thing. When I first started doing this, I could get, a, and I, I, I do it in small batches, so it's just not worth, you know, doing a, you know, setting up a spray gun and, and doing it that way. So I use rattle cans and that generally works pretty well for me. And, when I first started doing this, I could probably get a can of, of auto touch up for five or six bucks. And then within the last couple of years, it was like 10 bucks a can. Still, you know, not, not, uh, not great, but not painful. Um, I just went to buy some uh, at an auto parts store, and it's now $15 a can. So I found some through. Uh, at one of the automotive uh, performance stores, and they had a you know a decent price. I think it was like nine or ten bucks. I said, "Well, that's better than fifteen. So I ordered a dozen cans. Well, they said, "Oh, it's back ordered, and uh, we're expecting it sometime around April first. I said, "Okay, I can wait that long. So um, April that- fools. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you, Billy. And so, uh, so finally, I got notice that it's shipped today. Now it's what May second, and uh, you know it's just crazy that paint has gone up this 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 much. And it's not just lacquer. Um, a good friend of mine, Bill Crook from Crook Custom Guitars, uh, uses primarily poly finishes, and the automotive poly that he uses, he says, is about five or six times as much as it was just a few years ago. So it's it's just becoming, and I'm sure Barry, you you know the the finishes that you do, um, I'm sure you're you find that paint is is not the not the bargain that it once was. <laughs> so that's my gripe for this week. I mean, uh, it's you know people wonder why things cost what they do, and it's all these little bits and pieces. And in this case, you know, it's a ten or a fifteen dollar can of spray paint that. You know, adds to the cost of the product. Is it a specific color that's a problem? Well, mostly the it's a gold was what I use. You know, um. it's like a sunburst gold metallic. Um, I mean, I can get some other good substitutes for a little less money, like black lacquer, white lacquer, silver lacquer. But the gold is the tricky one, and I, you know, I use a very specific one to match up with vintage guards. Mm-hmm. So indeed. So there you go. That's yeah. That's my music world this week. Well, and for Barry's edification, uh, can you explain what you do, Tony? And maybe even first timers. Well, you know, Todd, I had actually already talked about that, where I shoot the backside of clear. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, that's specific to the oh, thing you were talking about. Oh, what I do for a living? <sighs> yes. <laughs> I make custom pick guards. <laughs> there you go. Great. <laughs> so I do a lot of. Gretchen Guild and and Rickenbacker replacements, in addition to other things, and gassed out arch top ones. Oh boy, yeah, the arch top oh. ones. Those are <laughs> those are a blast. I've got yeah, I've got some in the works right now. Yeah, but and, yeah, and and awesome uh, guitarist from Valentino's. Oh yes, from what yes, I understand. yeah. I, 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 you know, I'm gonna have the you know in my uh, in my memoriam, I'll no, say uh, in the Wall of Fame, pick, pick guard provider to. The- to Todd yeah. from the my, Valentinos. You got to hang my picture in your bathroom. <laughs> oh, I can do that. I write in the urinal. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Barry, let's hear from you. What's going on in your music world this week? Maybe that doesn't have to do exactly with building guitars. Well, I actually kind of had just a fun experience. I uh, went to see a band two nights ago, and and uh, some guy comes up to me and recognizes me in the club. And is super happy to see me. And it turns out he's a uh, maybe a beginning pedal builder. Oh, cool. So he runs out to his car and he gives me one of his pedals to try out. Nice. So I got fantastic. Like a, right? I mean, how cool is that? I go to a club to see a band and come home with a with a cool Germanium boost pedal. 
Nice. Made by a guy that lives like the town next town up. Who, who is it? Wait, I have to get the name. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. It's called Freestone. And he's on Instagram. We'll have and to check uh, him out. yeah. And uh, I'm digging the pedal. It's really cool. And yeah, you know, how often does that happen, right? Hey, yeah. I think I know who you are. Check out my cool pedal. That's really that's that's kind of a neat so, thing. It was really nice, yeah. I love that. Freestone. All right. <laughs> Gonna have to check it. That's, that's right. It's Freestone. Freestone, like yep. the peaches. Yep. What? Yep. Freestone peaches. What's a Freestone peach? The, the pit comes right out. What? Are you making this up? I've I never am not heard of a Freestone this. peach in my life. Oh, my God. And, and you have family in, I, in Georgia. Well, they didn't. We're not from there. I mean, yeah. And Georgia peaches aren't even good. Peaches aren't even from Georgia. That's the, just the marketing thing. Anyways, it's true. It's Look true. it up. Freestone peach. <laughs> Freestone peach. One hundred percent true. You can, you can cut the peach right on the on the on the on the crack. Yeah. And cut it open and twist it, and the pit comes right out. Yeah. That's amazing. I, you have me. Uh, I'm. I'm all the lathered up about these peaches. <laughs> <laughs> and then you you take the pits out, and then you grow them. Yeah. Put them on your grill. Oh, it's a, okay, yeah. And then serve them up with ice cream. The pits? No, the peaches. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. God. Barbecuing a pit. No, you barbecue the peach. In the pit. Not the pit goes in the trash. No, a barbecue pit. You could use a barbecue pit or a grill. Your choice. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> Who's on first? <laughs> uh, anyways, um, Billy is hard at work, and 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 we're gonna ch- we're all gonna ch- go and check out Freestone. Make sure we do that. Aside from all this nonsense we you just heard, uh, Billy, <laughs> did we get you, did we catch you at a bad time? No, you caught me at a perfect time, Todd. Perfect. Here's why. Here's my guitar week. Yes. Um. I am doing a little experiment on uh, what was known one time in the 70s as Le Trem, L-E-S space T-R-E-M, Le Trem. And it was a tremolo designed for a Les Paul with a stop tailpiece, okay? And it had a little spring-loaded thing that you would kind of like stick onto the guitar and then... um, had a little, had a little, um, Bar. little whammy, you know, yeah. and it worked tremendously. And I don't know uh, why they stopped making them, or uh, I don't know. They were just really hard to find. And then finally, um, maybe 10, 12 years ago, uh, Dusenberg came up with um, a version of the Le, Le Trim. Yeah, and it's well, a and, wondrous and to be device. Specific, it's not L E Trim. It's the the spelling is L-E-S. L-E-S. Yeah. Like less trim. Le tre- yeah. But yeah. it's not. I'd yeah. like more trim myself. <laughs> I know. Um, so anyway, uh, what I'm doing, that I, and, I, and I install those Duesenberg tremolos on. You have a whole box of them here. Oh, my That's God. Crazy. I, I've put them on like a dozen or more guitars. Yeah. And I love it. And um, it gives you the tremolo. It's almost like a Bigsby feeling. And uh, it's simple to install. And put it on any stop tail guitar. You can put guitar. on anything, any stop tail piece guitar. And it doesn't, uh, it's not destructive. Not destructive. You can take it back off and there's no holes, there's no drilling, there's no nothing like that. Yeah. Uh, Do the, they come with uh, US <clears throat> and metric uh, well, screws? Well, good systems, yes. The, the Duesenbergs come with um, two way. different post styles. Yeah. And uh, the one's metrics, one's American fretting, and also several um, little washers that you can use to build up, build up okay. heights, so you can get all the all the right angles. Um, yeah, you know, to uh, to mate up with your your particular. But the um, one that you're putting in today yeah. is the is, is like I mentioned at the beginning here. Yeah. Um, that's the eBay one that I got. It's a generic eBay one. Yeah. Uh, that was about so, a half like a half the Chinese cost of, of the Duesenberg, uh, w- which the Duesenberg is also uh, manufactured by a company called Goldo. Goldo, G-O-L-D-O. Okay. Oh. Um, yeah. So, they're, so if you they're, find they're the Goldo the same, one. Yeah, they're the, the same thing. Yeah. They're the same thing. It's just a different, they, different name. Those come from France. 
I believe. Yeah, they're I believe all that's shipped correct. from France. I believe that's correct. Just like the original Le, Le, yeah. Le Goldo. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we thought that would yeah. be a really neat experience because he's he's so familiar uh, yeah. with that actual piece of equipment. So seeing, well, what is this other one that's almost identical to it? There are some differences, but uh, can't yeah, wait to hear more different. about that. Yep. No, the the base plate is the is really the big one. Oh, is it really? Yeah, because the the um, generic one has a larger footprint. Not not huge, but larger okay. for sure. Specifically in the rear portion of that, on the Duesenberg, it's sort of a like a just a, a subtle curve. Mm -hmm. um, like a boomerang. Right. So it's a single piece. Yeah. Uh, and it, it almost like if you took your stop tail and it was just bent a little bit. Okay. This one has a plate uh, that that sits that sits underneath that it has actually a little bit of like um, well, kind of a triangular shape. Barry, you're yeah. kind of an engineer. Like it, it 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 posts out to like almost a triangular shape for uh, better stability. So I guess if you're like pulling it back, it's less likely to upend because it's got more of a. Uh, lengthy footprint on the on the uh, actual thing sure <laughs> that's the best response you could have possibly given a... <laughs> <laughs> yes yes <laughs> what he said <laughs> yeah, what I said. yeah what i said um uh, if you yeah i'm not gonna try to re-explain don't worry about it it's fine all right um, todd what's going on well, in your music world this yeah. week um <laughs> So I was recently talking about uh, the Fender pedal board that I got. I'm yes. really excited about it. It's super. They thought of all the great things about a pedal board and made it yes. cheap, and it's. I really like it. Uh, I ordered the in and out jack for that. Uh, so you can, they have the holes already pre-drilled. Oh so yeah, yeah, put, yeah. You can put the uh, solderless. So I said it right. You said it. The solderless nice. uh, in and out um, jacks. Yeah. Uh, so those came to you. Those buggers are expensive. Yeah. Those are 20 bucks a piece. Yeah. What the heck? That's like a third of the board. But when you think about it, it's like one long cable. I mean, it's it's all self-contained. That that doesn't help me with the I know. money. Anyways. Just print your own. That's more what importantly, I, I one of the reasons I got the board was because I needed a little bit more real estate, not lengthwise to put necessarily more pedals, but I was using this JHS switchback, which allows me to... It's just like a single click uh, looper, mm -hmm. essentially. So I can go, uh, you know, I can go with drive stack one or drive stack two, so gotcha. that I don't have to tippy toe all over the place. In the front, I like the idea of like, hey, I, I'd, I'd really like to be able to switch in and out of a uh, fuzz from my actual stack and not have to undo the stack to to do that. Uh, and so now I'm trying to find the right fuzz to go with the sound, which is, hey, I thought I knew what it was. And now, now uh, I've got cables and pedals all over the floor. Well, then you, I mean, you've got it, a half dozen fuzzes, don't you? Well, it's a process, Tony. You got to plug it in. You got to play it. You got to go, hmm, is this good? I don't know. Do I like it? Maybe. <laughs> okay. And then I then I have to say, what if I do this one? And then you forget how the other one sounds. Uh, <laughs> so right. anyways, I'm I'm in the midst of doing that and it's making me go, Well, maybe there's other ones I should be considering out there that I don't have. Uh, yeah, the trap. The gas mm, trap. They've got you. Yes. They got your um, number. Um and uh so there that's that's what I've been up to, but it's exciting. It's fun. It's, it's, it's this stuff is so much fun. Like I can I think of a better time of my time spent than just sitting around on the floor with a pile of pedals going, what does this one do? <laughs> I think I could yeah, probably I, find so? some better things to yeah, do. I don't know. But uh, yeah, you know, hey, uh, that's you, Todd. Yes, that is me. Um, Barry, are you, do you like futz around with, uh, you know, the gear like that? Do you get deep, deep into it? I don't. I you know the busier I get making guitars, the less I actually play them. Mm -hmm. So uh, like it's pizza. kind of a it's an unfortunate situation, but uh, it's just the way it is. Yeah. Well, fortune favors the people that are committed to it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what they really meant to say back then. Uh, whatever Caesar said that. Okay. Tony? Yes, Todd? You know what I need to put all these 
pedals and stuff together? I know exactly what you need. What? You need some Tour Gear Design patch cables. That is absolutely correct. And I a have bunch some of on them. the way. And a bunch of them. Oh, good. You All, did make an order. I, yeah, I did. And I got specific lengths, too, to supplement the crazy lengths that I already have. Nice. So did you remember that when you, after you go to your, load up your cart and go to your checkout, there's a place for a coupon code? I absolutely did. Did you put in the guitar knobs? I did. So you saved an additional 10%. I did. Wow. And it's... it's Wait a minute. What site where this, was that this located was on? TourGearDesigns.com. Okay. Yep. Go and do that. And in fact, um, I also got wind, uh, the great Dr. No sent me a note. Hey, I just oh. ordered my Tour Gear Design patch cables to set up Alan Johannes's board. So, hey, oh, nice. if it's good enough for Dr. Doe and Alan Johannes and and me. <laughs> yeah, especially you. <laughs> you should go check them out, too. Uh, so thanks so much to the guys at uh, Tour Gear for sponsoring our four on the floor. Go ahead, Tony. <clears throat> Let me get a little bit of this. That was a really good one. One, two, one, two, three, four on the floor. All right, Barry from Grez Guitars. What is your four on the floor? All right, number one, Blackstone Appliances. Ooh. Kind of an overdrive pedal with two stages and some EQ capability. So you can kind of set it to be flatter or more mid-forward. You That's... can kind of set one, one side to be like always on and just a little and one side to be, you know, really going for it. Yeah, I think... Uh... The guy who, who owns a studio here actually has one of those on his board. Oh, he does. Yeah, um, the uh, the knobs are the 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 uh, potentiometer screws are kind of like set into the pedal, if I recall. Is that correct? Yeah, you have to use the tip of your pick to adjust them, so you can't change it once you find your settings you like, which is you know kind of good, I guess. Yeah, you're not gonna kick it with your foot. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great sounding pedal, and it's um they're kind of unique in the pedal world just for the sound they have, the form factor, and the drop screws yeah. and everything very it's, industrial. It's its own animal, and uh, I think it, it you can set it up so it sounds like an amp overdriving. Uh, so it you, you, you know it's it's not a, so much an effect as it is just sounds like your, your amp crank, but you don't have to crank your amp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's a little bit uh, <laughs> confusing because there's it looks like the screws are holding in the the face plate. It's got like the old timey. Uh, well, not old timey. I mean, it's not like yeah. Bro Brother, where art thou? But um, like your washing machine appliance, yeah, like bonafide. Yeah, pre <laughs> pre war era uh, appliance and tooling uh, placards that are very popular in the pedal world. Um, and I remember looking at this thing. I'm like, where the crap are the knobs? <laughs> and and John just sat there and let me f fluster a bit. And and he's like, it's the screw heads, you dope. <laughs> Right, uh, like there are no oh. no knobs. <laughs> yeah, it's a little weird too because it's one of the few pedals out there that the the actual potentiometers on are on the ends of the of a horizontal pedal. So uh, it, it's not like in the middle where if you got a vertical pedal and you put the 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 foot switch sort of at the base of it. Oh yeah, it's just kind of mid it's a horizontal yeah, it's pedal. Midway, yeah. midway. Yeah. And they're on the left side and the right side, which is kind of unique and it's got top mounted jacks. Yeah, the whole thing's a little peculiar, but it is. I dig it. Yeah, it is. It's a it's a unique thing. Um and those are those are holding their their prices. That's a a moderately uh price that's a moderate investment some not yeah. not a deep not not so bad not so bad no i've had it a long time and i remember when i bought it it kind of felt a little pricey but doable but that was a long time ago it i've had this is. thing a long time it still yeah. is yeah <laughs> yeah there those are uh running around like 250 right now okay yeah uh what's next next is the exotic effects sp compressor the one with the little switch so that you can have uh low, medium, or high compression, and a blend so that you can still have some of the clean, uncompressed signal blended with the compressed signal. Yeah, we... Um, it's a mini pedal. Like yeah, we are, we are fans of the, uh, um, the EP. EP Boost. Yeah. Yep. And um, and I've, I've been tempted to, to check out the SP, and they have one other one that's... A I didn't know about... I honestly didn't know about the, uh, the, the blend. That's really cool. I love a blend knob. Yeah, I, I actually use it on its lowest compression and like 50-50 blend, and it's it's just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, 
if you want something super compressy, it'll do it, but that's, it's not really what I need. So, yeah. Well, you're not doing '80s movie themes, so <laughs> I mean, <laughs> although that is kind of the rage right now. So. <laughs> um, no, it's it sounds like if you recorded in a studio and they put on some slick compressor just to, to tighten things up, it sounds yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. How about number three? Okay, so I'm kind of into reverb. So number three is Carl Martin's headroom pedal which is a giant pedal board spring reverb uh with two different sides so you can kind of there's a there's a like a mix and a tone and you can toggle between so you can kind of set one a little like darker and less and one a little more and splashier mm -hmm. and it's a real spring reverb and it sounds really really good because i don't actually love the super clangy fender reverb some, uh -huh. some of them, they sound a little bit too much like just sheet metal rattling to me. Yeah, some of yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, no, so this I, is I, just a, a little point. warmer. I also favor a non-Fender-y reverb uh, for, the, for the core of my music. And recently I made up uh, a song where I said, you know what? I'm going to go to the deep, dark, dank depths of the reverb tank for this one and and i was kind of in uh unfamiliar territory it took me a while to kind of really dial in that specific sound but that's where you that's where you need hold on billy let me turn you on that's <laughs> where you need the surfy sound yeah swell pedal it ah. goes with the reverb units and it lets you focus on that synth that that mid frequency to highlight where the reverb really kicks in. Ah, where, where you can I gotcha. fine tune yeah, the sound. I like yeah. that. Now I have one of the Carl Martin uh, red repeats pedals, which is uh That's has a great delay. Yeah, it's well it's it's a it's 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 not it's got one or two really good sounds. It just sounds good. It That's sounds like it, it sounds it, like it, a there's no whiz banger yeah, to it. Slap back echo sounds great. Uh, some of the other stuff it's it's a little bit of a stretch, but you know yeah. it's one of those old pedals that just Still sounds pretty good. Yeah, yeah. You know what's interesting? Um, when you got the headroom, did you think it was a tape delay? No, I knew what I was getting. Yeah, yeah. I was looking for um, a spring reverb sound that I liked because, like, again, a lot of them I don't like. Right. The, um, well, the reason I ask is if you look at the, if everybody's looking this up right now, it looks like what a lot of tape. Um, oh, the pack, the form factor is like echoes, big yeah. and it looks horizontal. Like a tape echo. Uh, yeah. a and the name is confusing, that. right? The name doesn't make sense to me. I don't know what that's about. Right, so. and it's got the the little function, the little extra bits on the front where you can adjust. I'm assuming that's where you adjust the springs. Um, it's to lock the springs because like I don't go anywhere with it. But if you were touring with this thing, I suppose you'd you'd be able to somehow lock the springs so they're not just rattling down the road. Oh yes. I like that action. That 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 makes yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Like a drum, like a drum. Yeah. The bottom of a drum. For all of you guitar players, there's a thing on the bottom of a drum that makes it sound like a, <laughs> a snare. And but rattling around, and you're like, stop rattling around if you're just talking, and then you lock it. Drummers, go check them out. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> guys that like to hang out with musicians. Yeah. Check it out. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's these drummers. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's go to number four. How, by the way, let's see how much. Those are about 280 right now. Secondhand? Um, or new? No, no. At, from Carl Martin, it looks like. Okay. okay. Uh, I think I bought mine secondhand, but, you know. Let me, let me see. Why no, not that's on Amazon. Am. That's on Amazon. 279. Kind of shocked that you can find that on Amazon, actually. I'm not trying to look there, everybody. Don't <laughs> throw stones at me. <laughs> uh, anyways, all right. Four onward. Prorsome, number, as the British number, say. <laughs> number four is another reverb pedal. Ooh. The uh, new neighbor, uh, Wet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, That one creeps up every now and again. That's been on the show a couple times. Yeah, and I like them in tandem because uh, I can set the new neighbor to be kind of dark with very little pre-delay. So it just makes the, the, the sound more just bigger and fatter. And 
and then it goes away and you're left with the spring tails, which is really cool. Hmm. Because uh, the spring has like a little pre-delay built in, right? It just takes a minute to get those springs going. It just naturally has some pre-delay, and I fill it in with uh, the new neighbor. Now, that is also, well, actually, I feel like when that first came out, that was pricier than it is it, now. It was a little pricier back then. I mean, yeah. I've probably had it for, I don't know, eight years, right? maybe something like that. It's been around a uh, uh, around here a long time because he didn't have quite the offering that he has now like back then there were like two or three pedals maybe from him right i think the one that he uh, the immerse kind of put him in the like oh well okay that's a uh, the emo the immerse and the iconoclast those were the two that that kind of were out uh, roughly at the same time i believe and um uh they were they were very european and very precision and very like that's gonna that's expensive um but you knew it was gonna do the thing it, it's kind of it's kind of weird it's like um am i am i doing it am i saying it right am i way off you can tell me you can tell me barry what am i uh, uh, like the description of what what yeah. oh well yeah i mean i think that i don't know the other ones the immerse and the, the you know i i went for the uh wet because it has it's stereo or mono mm -hmm. and i and it's a real stereo, right? It isn't just some simple little algorithm. And and it um, is, I think, like almost, again, like studio quality. Like I, I, I guess I really like good sounding reverbs. And this yeah. thing sounds like a serious piece of gear. Yeah. And that's kind of where I was going with the, um, uh, with the form factors. Like the, at the time all the boutique guys were coming out and it was all about like crazy graphics and, and uh, goofy knobs and, you know, all the things that can do like a million things. And, um, and their offerings were, they were like adult pedals, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it's just like, it's like an Audi or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's just a quality to it. Like I would have friends that are like really good studio engineers come over and they'd listen to it and they'd smile. They're like, Oh, that's a good sounding reverb. Right. And these are guys who know what good sounding reverb sure, sounds like. Sure. Yeah. If the, if the people who are recording stuff say, Ooh, that's good. You know, you got a winner. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, this has been great fun learning about your pedal, uh, delights over there. And, uh, we got a, a couple, we got a couple ones that we don't really have on very often. And, and, um, uh, a couple of new ones, I think. So that was really fun. Um, just out of curiosity, Barry, what kind of music do you tend to play yourself? Um, I would say regular old rock and roll. You know, nothing, nothing too uh, genre specific. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let me uh, tickle that a little bit more. Uh, let's say. Tickets and um, living or dead doesn't matter. What are your top three shows that you'd go that you would want to go to this year? Oh, if I could just pick anybody, anything, huh? yeah, yeah, anybody, anytime. Whoa, you got front row. That is too hard. Oh my gosh! Well, think. that's why I gave you three. <laughs> you can do it. All right, you got to bear with me. I got to. Let's see. Let's see. How about something non-guitar related? Sure. Like, this isn't like, going on your LinkedIn, so it'll be fine. Like, <laughs> like I've never seen Elton John. Oh, yeah. That there would be something, right? Yeah, like uh, late 70s or 80s era, maybe. Yeah. Probably yeah. not the Disney era, right? I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> let's be honest. And I, all right. And then uh, this is not deep thought, but I, I never got to see uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan before he passed. And I think that would be a spectacle, like whether you're a super fan of his or not. Just oh, the, yeah. The prowess, like to see him, some of the videos I've seen of him playing live is just intense. That yeah. would be cool. Yeah. That would be super cool. Uh, dipping into the dead category. Okay. Uh, one more, huh? Um, hmm. John Lee Hooker. Really? 
Okay. That would be cool. Yeah. Would John Lee cool. Hooker. In a, in a real small place. In a really, it would have to be a super small little place. Exactly. A little club. Believe it or not, I saw John Lee Hooker in a super small place called really? Stashes. Stashes. On High Street. Stashes. In Columbus. <laughs> yeah. He was really cool. Neato. Yeah. 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 So great, great one. I love that. Was it? Was it? I'm like on a, your page, Chris. Was it like a sleeper thing, <laughs> like where the, the the place wasn't full up, or was it like people were out the door? Mm, it was packed, but it wasn't too packed. Yeah, it was really cool. It was right, it was after the Blues Brothers movie, so it would have been like maybe a eighty five, eighty six, something like that. Yeah, you know. So people knew who he was by that time. Yeah. Again. 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 You know? Probably for like the third time. Yeah. Because right. there, there was the Stones get, get, gave him a little bit of extra life there too. Exactly. <clears throat> uh, fantastic. Well, that's, that's a really nice spread. Nobody can argue with that. That's fantastic. I like that. Thank you, Barry. That helps us <laughs> know you a little bit more, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, all right. And uh, one more. What? It, it, somebody's making a sandwich for you. What, what kind of sandwich is that going to be right now? Don't think too hard. What is it? It's a Reuben. Well, okay. Oh, nice. See, we're getting to know Barry here. This is great. Uh, you know, John what, what meat? I love it. <laughs> oh, oh the, I get the, those two the confused. The Polish guy is getting riled up. Yeah, meat. Right. So it's normally either uh, corned beef or pastrami. Corned beef or pastrami. But there are some <laughs> questionable Reubens that use turkey. Why well, would you do that? That's just that a turkey sandwich with salad sense. dressing. Yeah. <laughs> and sarcasm. No. <laughs> so I guess it's corned beef or pastrami. It's kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not so expert to know which is better. Hmm. Yeah. Mm. Just a good Reuben. Do you like pepper? Pepper? Like salt and pepper? <laughs> yeah. Like a like a pepper cured one? Yeah. Well, sure. Pe Absolutely. Because yeah. pastrami <laughs> has a big... Coat uh, of pepper on yeah. it. Yeah. I think anything with peppercorns on the outside is probably good with me. All right. Yeah. Ooh, all right. You got a pastrami uh, Reuben heading your rye, way. Rye? Rye? <laughs> well, you got to have rye. Well, of course it's rye. I mean, you would think that, but people mess around with these things. Now, seedless or seeded? Oh, seeded. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. For sure. Oh, seedless is so much better. Now what? Yeah. What, oh, what yeah. seeds on rye bread? I'm confused. Caraway rye. seeds. Caraway. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 Got to have Ooh. it. I don't like caraway seeds. Dark mm. rye. Dark rye. None of this light rye stuff. Mm. How yeah. about how about the marble rye? Okay. We'll I'll meet you in the I just <laughs> bought some a loaf of mock rye at the farmer's market. Uh, amazing. Gluten-free. Mock But rye. it has the caraway seeds. Yeah, so, I like yeah. that. I like and that. a little bit of chocolate. <laughs> that's weird. Well, okay. Yeah, it is weird. Okay. So, it is weird. weird. Well, that's I mean, how you how make. Do you, how do you make rye without rye? Well, I mean, that's that's pumpernickel. Pumpernickel has I mean, cocoa in it. Yeah, yeah. that's what go. makes it dark brown. Mm. Yes, and nickel. On this week's bread that? podcast. Oh, okay, <laughs> so <laughs> hey, <laughs> listen, <laughs> we've <laughs> got. All right, we, uh, Billy, can you uh, can you hand me the the grizz real quick here? Oh, geez. okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special instrument here. Barry was so kind to send this guitar to us, and we're going to have to get it on its way to a, the next person who gets to be bedazzled by this thing. So we've got this beautiful black, light as a feather. It is so crazy picking this thing up, seeing how light it is. Um, and what is the model on this one? Tell, tell us all about the, what we have here. It's, it's a Mendocino. Okay, uh, Mendocino County. I'm assuming that's... Yep, yeah. and the town of Mendocino, yeah. which is north of me. Just uh, uh, well, it's three hours north. It's a ways, but but uh, so the uh, the top on that guitar is reclaimed, salvaged, old growth redwood, mm. and a lot of that would have come from Mendocino, right? That's where a lot of the sawmills were. So that's where the name comes from, right? It's named for the place where the wood comes from. Yeah. Wow. And then the and now the top of that. What's the uh, what is the body of the guitar made of? <laughs> the body is a one piece Honduran mahogany, and so is the neck. So it's a big chunk of mahogany that's hollowed out into a semi hollow. Right, and then the the Honduran is lighter than the African mahogany. Is that what you were saying, Tony? Yeah, African mahogany typically yeah, is pretty heavy. heavy. Yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> And it's actually it's that's kind of a misnomer because it's known as African mahogany, but it's a completely different uh, species. 
Okay. Well, all right. We'll get we'll bypass that altogether. Um, <laughs> we, we could just generalize. It's mahogany. Yeah, it's mahogany. That's okay. We don't have to get too specific. And so mahogany neck, mahogany body, super hollow with a redwood top. Nice. Now it's super hollow, uh, but is it is it like two big giant swimming pools, or is it like did you do a fancy routing like jigsaw puzzle? No, it's it's. Um, Kind of like two big swimming pools, I guess you could say, um, because as the instrument gets small, and this is a pretty small guitar, it's hard it to is. get it to. It's hard to get it to want to resonate. It's about the size of a red special, don't you think? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean, just, it's just, it's in know, the roundabout, so we can kind of wrap our heads around the people that yeah, can't I mean, see it. Yeah, I mean, less right Paul ish. It might be shorter, but the same. Lower bouts, but you know, it's in that neighborhood. Right? It's yeah, not a giant yeah. instrument. It's yeah, thing. like a Gretsch jet. Little, little I mean, Gretsch, yeah. 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 I yeah. think it looks like a. I think it's a lot like the the old silver tone 1420 Strat tone. Oh, the 1420. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the old silver tones. I mean, if we want to talk about the like the influence of it, yeah, let's aesthetic, do that. Yeah, right. There's silver tones. There's um, the 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 uh, not the you you were, you were saying Hagstrom uh, earlier, but it's not Hagstrom. The club, oh. um, the Hoffner. Hoffner, thank you. The Hoffner oh, there club. You go. Oh yeah, yeah. Has a similar that. kind of vibe to it. Totally. Um, and then there was a a, a Dan Electro model uh, that had a. Let me think. I think it was a. Of course, it wasn't real wood, right? But it was some kind of Mason, veneer. Masonite. Masonite. Yeah, yeah but, it, but it looked like uh, a walnut top with cream knobs. Oh, yeah, the convertible. Yeah, there's, it, there's a particular color scheme, though. Yeah, it's it's like fake wood top. I, I've got one. <laughs> ha, okay. And I, I just love the way that looked. I've never owned one, but yeah. you, know, you can kind of see like the whole wood. music around the other day. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So one of the amazing things about this, you pick it up. You go, holy mackerel, this might be the lightest guitar that's uh, lightest. Well, one of the lightest guitars you'll ever pick up. Um, but it doesn't feel, sometimes light can feel cheap. This does not in any way, shape, or form no. feel cheap at all. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you sometimes you get like Dan Electros and stuff, and you're like, eh, yeah, okay. Uh, but uh, this. Well, I guess there's a difference between being light and being stiff. Right, and that's something that kind of comes from the acoustic guitar world. Is you know the materials need to be stiff and and light, not just light and floppy. Yeah, well, there's yeah, and there's there's a lot of like uh, Japanese guitars and stuff that are like pretty lightweight, and you're like this just just doesn't feel like it's gonna like it was uh, got the right stuff to it. But this, well, contrary, not to only that. is it light, it balances so incredibly well. Yeah. The I mean, neck, there's you, you, there's not a neck dive on it, which is I, it kind of remarkable. Like how help us understand that? <laughs> well, that's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, right? Because I feel like as a designer, as a product designer, whether you're designing a guitar or whatever, if you design a guitar that has neck dive, well, then you weren't done designing it. Why did you stop and go to market? You weren't done. If it's neck diving, it's your design's wrong still. So keep working on it. Hollow out the neck. Yeah. <laughs> Do something, right? I don't know. I Whatever love it you is. Already. Yeah. Well, no, this is awesome. That, that's what he told us at NAM, and that's when Billy and I just did the look that we just did. We did the same one when we were sitting there talking to you, and we're like, okay, he's going to be great to talk to you because he, yeah. he gets it. He didn't just yeah, go, yeah, like, yeah. I don't know, made a cool guitar. Yeah. yeah. So, well, and you've like, got those Wilkinson uh, tuners that are like old, like the old timey Gibsons have. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's nice when things all come together, right? So, those tuners have a real cool vintage look and vibe to them. They work well, they're reasonably priced, and they're lightweight, right? You can't go hang some giant heavy tuner off the end of there. No. Can't do it. You don't want to do nope, that. You don't want to do that. <laughs> and uh, and then the body is you know hollowed out. But you know think about where you're hollowing it and where you leave. Where do you leave material? Um, and then the tailpiece, right? You got that big stainless steel Grez tailpiece on there. Yeah. Right. That's that's cool from an aesthetic. Hopefully, I think it is. Uh, it's uh, great for branding, right? The name's just out there every time you see the guitar. Yep. And it's ballast. Oh. Right, it's twelve gauge oh, oh, stainless yeah. steel. I said, yes, I thought you were saying it's balanced, like it was shaped. Oh. Well, it causes uh, balance because it is ballast. <laughs> yes, ballast. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Right. Yeah. It, right. That's, like it doesn't have to be twelve gauge. It could be. To, that's different than most tailpieces. Like yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, some of the early arch tops would have had like these giant brass tail pieces. And one of the reasons they were so hefty was to help keep the instrument in balance. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Well, you also have cool. some super lightweight pickups in here as well. Yes. You know, those are, I mean, compared to humbuckers, those gold foils are probably, I don't know if they're half the weight of a humbucker, but they, they might be. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the mm-hmm. one we have, uh, you, uh, this one. Has oh, that's the right. TV that one Jones. has uh, the TV Jones um, Diarmans, or he calls them T Diarmans. Yeah. But they're also super lightweight pickups. Uh, yeah. 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 See, yeah. I see, Tony. I knew what I was saying. Yeah. And I love those Diarmans. Like so, that. picture this surface mount piano gloss black, beautiful guitar with a single white binding on the top. Yeah. And these two uh, black. Um, I guess what do you call them? Black face, the, yeah. the black face pickups, mm-hmm. and then it, it, without even plugging it in, you just like that's a G the, to yeah. the tuning. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, G for Chris. It's a nice subtle F ah. hole too. It's a nice subtle F hole. Yeah, you know, it's and well, just the you. one. It, yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, I think I, I am a little picky about F holes, so I, I, I'm glad you appreciate that. I, I am think too. A, I think a lot of F holes are clunky and funky looking yeah, yeah. or diamonds yeah <laughs> right they're not <laughs> f-holes uh tony i'm gonna hand this over to you really quick no so as i don't i don't want to anything that before before that <laughs> oh yeah billy billy takes really good care of his instruments <laughs> so um anyhow okay so let's learn a little bit we've talked about this this amazing guitar in front of us um and you know, there were so many people. I'm, I'm surprised we even got to talk to you at NAMM, honestly, because when we went over there, your booth was slamming. It was uh, rock and roll. And really I really was. appreciate that you took the time to actually just say, yeah, let me tell you about this a little bit. And, um, you know, we weren't um, uh, merchants who were going to be going like, oh, we need 100 of these in the store next <laughs> week. You know, so it's like we're just a couple of schmoes going like, this is really cool. What is it? Yeah, that's what it's all about, though, right? Yeah. Tell Spread us about the your word. Ex- experience at NAM. What do you think? Was that your first run there? No. Um, normally, I do summer NAM. I think that's a yeah. And you know, historically, I feel like that has been a better investment. It's a little for a small company. Um, fair, fair. Yeah, you know, it, it's easier to be noticed. Um, it's costless. more fun after the show too. By the way, I yeah, think there's a lot like more the going on. Stuff is way more fun. Yep. So I've I've had normally I would do a summer NAM booth, which of course I haven't done for a few years now. Yeah. Um, and those are always super successful. Um, and then in Winter Nam, I would normally sponsor some concerts and clinics with some friends down there, mm. and we'd put on a little show offsite, and uh, you know, and film it, and have you know, use that for kind of cool content throughout the year. Um, so I'd always go to Winter Nam, but I, I normally don't do a booth there. Uh, but you know, this year I I was thinking, you know, it has been with COVID, it, it it's probably been almost three and a half years since I had a booth at NAM, right? Since before COVID, all the way back to summer NAM. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of time, I guess, to to come out and, and uh, well, show the wares a little bit. We certainly are glad you did uh, because uh, that turned us on to you and we got to meet you and now we've got this gorgeous guitar in front of us and we're going to find and, out about your story. And that's that's the reason I go, right? I mean, to, to put these things in people's hands. I, yeah. I, I think... I think that oh, it's not to get a twenty dollar taco bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Bad coffee. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah, I, I think uh, it uh, just like you're experiencing the the instrument and, and how it's just maybe a little different than others. Yeah, um, you can't really fully convey that on a website. No, 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 so, no. <laughs> so once in a while, you got to get out and put it in people's hands and. Uh, and the show was great for that. It was the booth was super busy. Um, I definitely felt like it was a little more serious this year. I, I think Nam was being stingier with passes, so they, they either cost more or, as a vendor, they gave you fewer passes with your booth. Mm. So there was maybe less riffraff running around because yeah. there were just fewer passes. So it seemed like everyone I talked to was serious in yeah. in one way or another. Like it wasn't a lot of time wasting happening. I think that what you just brought up is a valid point. Sometimes we're like, why does it cost so much? You know, but uh, you just pointed out something that can also make that experience uh, kind of annoying. If you, <laughs> if you're like, if you do have just a bunch 
of of people who are there for just like you know something to do um <laughs> that can, yeah. you know th that that crowds everybody else out so uh i didn't mind the cost yeah. of the ticket so and hey i met met you guys here i am Show was worth it right there, huh? Bada bing. <laughs> um, so let me understand where you, how did you fall into the guitar making business? Where, go for it. Oh, yeah. I'm going to try to summarize and just say that uh, I've always made my living as a product designer or designer in some way in the audio industry. Oh. So I used to design speakers for a living. I used to design, you know, equalizers and amplifiers. I started out as an electronics designer, actually. Okay. Um, and transitioned into, into being a speaker designer. Um, and then later just became an acoustical consultant. I stopped doing products and was just, you know, working on rooms, uh, spaces, concert halls, uh, basketball arenas, whatever. And, and I've always, of course, been a guitar player. And a hobbyist woodworker, right? I've had a table saw, a sander, and a few random woodworking tools in the garage. And one day I just thought, you know, I know about product design, and I know about acoustics and sound, and I know about guitars, mm -hmm. and I know about woodworking. That's kind of like all the stuff you need to maybe make a guitar. Mm -hmm. So I made one, and it came out all right. So I made some more. What was and the first model you made? It was an acoustic guitar, an OM style uh, steel string flat top acoustic. I actually started out making acoustic guitars, and then backed out of that a little bit. Yeah, that that, um, that you went right for it, didn't you? Yeah, it was that was the most <laughs> fascinating to me. It's it's funny because like designing a, a an acoustic guitar has a lot of parallels to designing a loudspeaker. You know, when you're designing a loudspeaker, every material has a sound. And you know, you touch the cone of the of the woofer, and you tap on the cabinet. Everything yeah. imparts something to the total. And an acoustic guitar is kind of like that too. Everything's resonating and thickness down, so it it you know jumps at the right frequencies. And and uh, so I don't know. I just related to it really well. It was all topics that all made sense to me that I'd already thought about designing speakers or designing rooms. Now it's an acoustic guitar that we're designing. Right, right. But then I realized, why would anybody? buy an acoustic guitar from Grez, right? So there's this like this new company, I've made three guitars or something like that, right? Why would anybody care? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't come up with a solid reason. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's the, right. it's the classic thing. Ahead. Look, <laughs> yeah, look, I made a thing. Aren't I amazing? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, somebody from come a, and from buy a it. product design background, um, first of all, you were like, I know exactly how to do this. <laughs> not, I'm just gonna. I'm not gonna be one of those other people that don't go into this with some forth, foresight. And then, w coming to that conclusion, I bet that was um, quite a quite a point in time where you're like, "Huh, there's not often that you, you you probably felt like that as a product designer." Right. It's sort of like doing something because you want to, mm. and then it's like backwards, right? Then figuring out, well, but can I sell this? <laughs> yeah. So I, I kind of slowly transitioned into building the guitar you have in your hands now because I was looking at what could I do that would be both interesting to me and maybe would fill a niche and be different than other things and like what would be my reason to exist. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, maybe people would be interested in my product because it's just not another acoustic guitar, another Telecaster, another whatever. Right, right. And uh, I mean, that was kind of a long process, evol uh, an evolution, if you will, over many years. I've been doing this for almost 15 years now, I guess. But, uh, um, but that was kind of the thing is acoustic guitars were fun, but yeah, so I made a good acoustic guitar. I don't know. Yeah. Well, then the next leap into you start making electrics. So yep. totally different thing altogether. That's like jumping from equalizers to speakers. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I, I totally dig old arch tops. Mm -hmm. uh, and so looking at like old arch tops, which leads to, you know, like an ES 350, uh, you know, eventually that gets thinned down to like a, like a 335 and just that whole evolution of the, acoustic arch top becoming an electric arch top yeah. and then a semi hollow body. And like that whole progression I think is super fascinating. And that's kind of where I thought I could make something that was unique. 
Um, cause I feel like, and, uh, you know what like an L5 is a Gibson L5? Yes. Yes. Okay. Like it's like truly an acoustic instrument. It's carved arch top. Um, so if we kind of like say that's our acoustic arch top, and then of course you have a Les Paul, which is your solid body. And then in the middle, you have a 335, the semi hollow body. Right. Except really the 335 isn't in the middle. It's much more like the Les Paul than it is the L5, right? It's not that acoustic really. So my thought was, can I make something that's really in the middle? Mm. Can I make something that's much more acoustic, but still an electric guitar? And that's kind of the path that eventually led to what you have there, right? It's small, it's light, it's comfortable, but it it does this, what is for its size, a pretty giant acoustic voice, which does something to the electronic sound too, of course. Right, right. There's a familiarity to it that doesn't feel like you're playing uh, uh, something that is either archaic feeling. Um, I sometimes if you pick up like a, especially like an older uh, jazz guitar, uh, it's, there's something about it. that's like, I gotta, I gotta be careful with this or, <laughs> or the, the only sounds that can come out of this are X, Y or, right. or, or Z. That's right. It's not flexible. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're bringing the elements that make those sound special and unique uh, into something in a, into a more modern player's hands. Yeah, I think it's a it's a unique combination of things, of sounds and materials, and you know some people dig it and some don't, and that's cool. Um, you know, luckily enough, people seem to dig it that I get to keep doing it. Yeah, I, I believe you had a um, baritone at the show yep. though, right yeah yeah the baritone does pretty well for me actually um because every company has a baritone it's like the token baritone in the line uh -huh. but these are you know five hundred dollar eight hundred dollar instruments you know they're okay um they scratch the itch if you just want a baritone and you're going to use it once in a while but if you want a really good baritone the number of choices slims down pretty quick got it and and luckily i'm on that list so um, yeah, I, I sell a lot of baritones, strangely enough. That's cool. Is it, I wonder if it is a, um, you know, every region has sort of musicality that kind of defines it up towards your way. Is there a, a big need for baritones? I realize you sell them all over the country, but no, as a matter of fact, you know, where I live is rural enough that I would starve if I tried to make a living off of the local market. Yeah. I mean, I do, you know, I do sell guitars in the San Francisco Bay area and in the local market, but i am not looked at the numbers. It's probably 5% of my sales. Okay. So it's not really a regional thing. You know, these are being sold, you know, there's the, the interwebs, people are buying them sure, all sure. over the country yeah. and yeah. all over the world. Yeah. Um, where are you getting some of your, uh, you know, we said something that feels familiar. There are familiarities about your stylings. Um, Talk, talk to us about some of the things that uh, gave you influences. Mm -hmm. Well, construction-wise, I, I feel like if you go all the way back to what some would consider the first modern electric guitar, which is the Bigsby Merle Travis guitar mm -hmm. from 1949, I think. Right. Now, that's really a semi-hollow body guitar. Um, and if you look at how it's constructed, and then you look at later guitars from like K... Um, and, other, and those sort of lesser brands, maybe they're actually constructed similarly. They just weren't constructed well or with high quality materials, but the, the idea behind their construction was similar. Um, so like I've got an old harmony stratotone here in the office, um, that is in some ways like a Mendocino it's hollow. It's got a, a spruce top instead of redwood, but you know, same kind of idea. It has gold foils on it. It sounds absolutely incredible. And you can't play it. It's yeah. just, it, you know, the neck is useless. Yeah. Uh, some of the frets are so high, you actually go up a fret and the note doesn't change, right? <laughs> so, so it needs oh, like a whole... Yeah. Yes. You it, start from scratch on those. It's a start from scratch, exactly. So, But the sound is stellar. Yeah. So <clears throat> talking about pickups a little bit, I, I know a lot of your models do have um, have gold foils. Uh, I mean, what what would be what's your dream pickup to use on 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 one of your guitars? 
Um, I would say in order, it's it's maybe gold foils and diarmins. Okay, like the one you have. Yeah, which actually have a very similar quality. They're not the same, but they're definitely in the same neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, especially the Lawler gold foils. Yeah, which have a little bit more meat to them than some of the more tra- more vintage correct gold foils. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of the more vintage correct ones are a little leaner in the low end and a little more aggressive in the top end. Mm-hmm. Um, where the Lawler is it's very gold foily, but it's mm-hmm. almost like a little more balanced. Yeah, I was going to say they they are definitely more balanced. Yeah, so it's a little bit more like a like the Diarmans. So we could almost call that a sound. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I don't make the that particular guitar with the P90s that often, but I do like P90s a mm-hmm. lot. Have you yeah. tried the um, um, the Lawler broilers, which are kind of <laughs> based on on Rickenbacker pickups? I've never tried one of those. Yeah, I've yeah. used I've used those in a couple of guitars, and they do have that same kind of uh, that Rickenbacker bite, you know, especially mm-hmm. early Rickenbacker. And, and I think that they're designed uh, that way so that they can, um, uh, you know, I guess reproduce the tone. Uh, without stepping on anyone's toes. Right. <laughs> In Santa Ana. <laughs> yeah, no, I've not tried those, but they, they sound like they'd be like right up my alley. Yeah. Um, you know, I like really sort of lightly or unpotted P90s that have a little more bite to the top end. Yeah. Not yeah. overly muted. Yeah. That's and then and in terms of you know like finish work I I know like the one that we have obviously has been done up is that is that a lacquer finish? Yep, it's nitro um, sprayed here in the shop. Mm-hmm. The that one is um, I guess you know the the traditional way to do a black guitar you know if you go way back in time is with black lacquer right where I'm doing really a a black lacquer coat to color it and then clear coats over the top. But yeah, build it up that way. Build it. So it's maybe a little more a, a modern approach, but still old materials. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, we spray them here. They got to hang around for several weeks to cure, and then we yep. sand and buff them. And yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, trying to think of some of the other particulars. I mean, you said you mentioned earlier you like the lighter tuning machines. It helps with the balance a little bit in terms of the weight of the guitar. Yep. Um, have you you know do you, on request or on other models? Do you use a um, you know a you know, like a sealed tuner or anything like that? I will usually use anything somebody wants as long as it does, as long as it makes sense, right? It's not like going to screw something up or just totally out there. But um, I normally tell people, just tell me what you want. And I'll tell you if I can do it. Okay. Like I get people all the time emailing, well, what are my color choices? I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> What's your favorite color? Tell me, and then I'll tell you if we can do it. You know, it's it's not so rigid, right? It's not like here's our catalog of six options. You can only yeah. choose these six options. Yeah. So, no. What's your like coolest configuration? What do you just totally dig? Yeah. And then just tell me that. And maybe I can do it. Maybe I can't. But let's start with that. Start with what you're like super into and excited about. Yeah, and I think one of the really cool things that you know from from reading you know the information on your website and that is is the use of the of the reclaimed redwood, um, and uh, I think that you know it, it makes sense in terms of being ecologically responsible, um, and you know it does kind of have a, a tone of its own. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that it really plays into the equation. What, before you answer that, can you elaborate on? Um, well, I guess your answer would be an elaboration on that, but but I, I mean, I, I want to uh, throw in a little. Can you give us the background on like what why you chose to do that, and uh, does it have any other meaning beyond its sonic value? Yeah, I think. Um, well, first of all, like in Northern California where I am, it's just the wood, right? Everything here yeah. was made of redwood way back when. That was yeah. just what we had. Um, so redwood is just everywhere. You know, the redwood forests are gorgeous. Um, and so I'm kind of fortunate that I have access to a material that everybody else has to go online and buy from some vendor who's curated it and put it on the website for sale. Like I can just go out and see a construction site where they're tearing down an old building or go to a local salvage yard and find some of this amazing wood. Yeah. So I have access to it, which is part of it, right? And if it was much harder to get, it might be more it might change my feeling about it, um, but I, I can get it. Um, and then, you know, the the fact that it is such a good 
tone wood. I hope, you know, don't get ruffle feathers using that word, right? <laughs> all, all wood has tone, but you know, this yeah. wood has, is very, it's a very toneful wood. How's that? Yeah, um, I like it. It's surprisingly light, which is, you know, right up my alley. Um, I think it's beautiful. I think it, it also varies a lot. So, you know, you've got redwood that's much more beige and more red and darker and figured and there's sinker redwood and burl redwood, right? So it's not like, oh, we're just using redwood. We have one look. That's a surprising variety of aesthetics available with redwood. Um, and then th there's also the fact that it is, at least the wood that I'm using, is uh, well-seasoned or cured. Um Right, a piece of wood that is a hundred years old sounds different than a brand new piece of wood. Yeah. Right. So I'm cheating a little bit. Like I'm making like if you if you play if you I don't know if you played my junior when you were at the trade show, but if you when you play that junior, it does something in terms of its sort of vibrance and how much you know the whole thing is alive and vibrating that you might get from a vintage junior that's you know 50 years old because it's built from a piece of wood that's that is that old. It's even older, right? right? Most of these chunks of wood I'm using are 100 years old. Um, so yeah, it, it imparts something. 100 years uh, out of the out of the. Uh, that's right. Growth the tr stage. That's like right. That. Most it, and, it, and sometimes it's even more. But yeah. but yeah, you could you know the tagline is kind of like it was it was a tree for a thousand years, a bridge for a hundred, and now it's a guitar. That's your tagline. And, yeah, and that's, that's kind of the deal, line. right? Well, that, and that's what I mean. It's like it's 100 it's years true. old. It, it, yeah, once it became not a tree. But before that, you it was a thousand years really old. Really old growth wood, which is, we've talked about this on the show. It's like, how much uh, is the sound, I guess, being impacted by new growth trees and, you know, all that stuff? Certainly right. the construction industry has suffered terribly. Well, well, yeah. So, and it's not like old wood is amazing and new wood sucks. It's just with redwood specifically, the new wood is farm raised for like fence boards and construction lumber. Yeah. So it's growing super fast. Right. And so if you look at the growth rings, it, it's all just um, like summer wood. You know, you see those dark lines, like light, dark, light, dark, the yeah. growth rings. Yep. So in the really old wood, they're super tight together and the wood is has a stiffness. And the new wood, they're so spread apart, the rings, it's kind of like gummy and soft and smushy. Mm -hmm. And so new redwood is terrible for musical instruments. Mm -hmm. The old stuff is great, but of course you can't cut it down. Right. So the only way you can get it is to reclaim it from buildings and bridges and things like that. Interesting. Um, but when you start talking about something more like mahogany or maple, like these aren't so different between the older wood and the newer wood. Um, because it, you know, the old stuff grew unbelievably slow and the new stuff is growing super fast with the redwood. They're just so different. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, a new piece, piece of maple, I mean, that's why people are torrifying maple now, right? They're roasting it. They're trying right. to get, they're trying to cook it in a way that simulates being old. And, but the difference is nuanced, you know, and it, cool looking <laughs> and, and cool looking. Yeah. yeah. So the redwood is just cool all around. The fact that it's reclaimed, um, uh, is, me, is just a, like a good, uh, a wonderful byproduct, right? Yeah. Let me ask. Um, I know a lot of the redwood, there, are, there isn't just one redwood forest. There's a, you know, there's, there's kind of spread out, dotted, dotting the Northwest um, yeah. and California specifically. Um, and most of those are near the ocean. Yes. Do you what what do you have a theory at all on how, does the do you think that the 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 salt air uh, the salt water affecting the actual growth of the tree has is is there anything to that? I don't know if it's the salt specifically kind of stunting the growth or because some of it is inland enough that it's not super heavily sprayed with salt. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's the, the competition for light, right? The old growth forests, you know, if you're walking around there on the forest floor, it's pretty dark down there. It is. Right. Yeah. These trees really block out the light. Mm -hmm. So I think they really are just competing for light and nutrients and yeah, I think that's what it's about. 
Interesting. Okay, cool. Not but, exactly my area of expertise, yeah. though. Well, I, I've always wondered that because, like, there's not many trees that are that you're used, at least, okay, I'm going out on a limb, but if I'm going way off board, please forgive me, but um, I, I'm not a treeologist. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you were talking about maple and mahogany and stuff, and, you know, I'm thinking, well, those are trees that aren't necessarily coastal, um, right. So certainly there must be some element of difference, whether that comes out in tone, who knows. Um, but uh, just in its structure, it's, you know, it, it's different DNA made up of different uh, influences on, on both those things. And then yeah, and and even even like, um, you know, we had um, Carmine guitars. Uh, right. He's using pine. Yeah. Of some sort, right? All old growth pine. So you guys are doing basically... You're, with the same mentality, he's using reclaimed pine from a hundred years ago, um, yep. from all the Bowery stuff uh, that that you know, and and all these old, old, old buildings, planks, and all kinds of stuff, um, and that has unique qualities that can't be found anywhere else, simply because of where it's at geographically. Yep. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I know. I totally dig what they're doing over there, and uh, it's um, it's the same kind of vibe. Yeah, I mean, this wood is um, redwood isn't anymore. But when I first, I was going to say this wood is scrap wood to some people, but now what people, at least in Northern California, all get that redwood is cool and valuable. But when I first started using redwood, they were still taking buildings down. And some of that redwood was just going into the chipper. They were turning it into mulch to put into people's yards. Wow. And now, of course. The, yeah. <laughs> Philistines. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's like you go on like Craigslist and you got some guy. He's got, oh, I've got a little sliver of old growth redwood. It's like gold. Yeah. You know, they're always, everyone, you know, thinks they've got something super special. They kind of do, but. Yeah. That's cool. Well, I appreciate the deep dive into that. I think it is a, a a fascinating thing we've never run into redwood, uh, you know, uh, based guitar. So uh, I think it, it certainly is part of the story for sure um, for your guitars. Um, and it, the other guitars that are not semi hollow um, are those also using. Redwood? Yeah. So the the junior, which is a, of course a solid body, is also redwood, and it's it's a one piece body. So. That's in some ways even harder to find, to find pieces of redwood that are big enough to cut one piece bodies out of. Right. Um, and uh, what I've been using a lot of lately is uh, uh, bridge timbers. Ah. So the, the boards that would have held up the roadway, um, I've got some that are like six inches wide by 16 inches tall, like giant chunks of wood. And they would have been, you know, lined up and the road went on top of that. Yeah. And, uh, so those I can cut, you know, one piece bodies out of. Man. Wow. And so not only is it super old wood and it has that really lively resonant quality cause it's just so well seasoned, but there's no glue joints. That's cool. Yeah. Right. Super so. Cool. Yeah, that helps. You have the uh, at least if you go and you you're googling Grez guitars, you have the the Folsom on here. Is this something that you're still making? Yeah, yeah. So the Folsom is really just a different body shape, but it's the same idea. Yeah, you know, I I like probably most people love Telecasters, but I don't want to make a Telecaster, right? right. The, the world doesn't need me to do that. So that's kind of as close as I get to making a Telly, right? Well, maybe, a telly a, maybe a Rosewood or a Redwood uh, Telly would be. A red, redwood Telly? I, I think I did one time make a Redwood Telly for a guy, right? Mm -hmm. When you're first starting out and somebody wants to buy a guitar from you, you're kind of like, I'll make anything, <laughs> sure. Yeah. You know, where now if somebody asked me to make a Telly, I'd say, you know, sorry, I don't. Uh, tellies, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I think I did once make a Redwood Telly, but. Well, and this one is, uh, you mentioned Bigsby earlier. This has certainly got a little bit of a, oh, of it's a super, nod to Bigsby. Super Bigsby inspired. Yeah. So the. The shape of it is maybe not exactly, but it's pretty darn close to the shape of the original Bigsby and the pickguard. Kind of has some swirls to it that kind of mimic the uh, armrest bevels that that Bigsby put on his instruments. And right. So it's yeah, it's kind of Bigsby-ish with a little telly thrown in, and um, 
that's kind of its reason for existing, I guess, is yeah. to, for me to have something with a telly vibe that's not a telly. Well, and this one is especially interesting, or at least especially because I'm I'm looking at three of them together. You've got one with the 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 short, uh, the sort sort of standard telly bridge on it. Oh, the chopped telly bridge. Yep, the chop with the three yep. with three brass. And then you have the uh, larger aluminum trapeze style. Aluminium. Al- aluminium <laughs> this trapeze style, kind of like on the guitar that we have here. And yep. then you've got one uh, with the Bigsby on it uh, with on a solid body with Telecaster. That one's a real mixed up kind of yeah, guitar, and a lot that, going that on. One, that one might be my favorite, actually, the one with the Bigsby on it, just yeah. to, you know, to play it. Um, it looks yeah. cool. Super cool. Yeah, so those sell. I mean, that's not my big seller. It seems like I'm most, at this point, just become most known for the Mendocino. Yeah. So, and it's derivatives, right? So there's the bass version and the baritone and the this and the that. But they're all, you know, so the Mendocinos are probably what sell the most. But Folsom's Folsom sell and they're cool. Yeah. Um, well, certainly to somebody who is, uh, in, you know, I think California, we just had the pleasure of when we were out there at nam uh billy and i went to go see x and uh Ooh. and uh, oh. also uh james enfeld i think that kind of vibe of music they they do like the bigsby stuff the yeah. old timey <laughs> you know cuff jeans and bigsby's you know he Big, got bigsby's has its place yeah for sure yep. yeah do you know the builder tk smith yes, yes. Yeah. So, well, I mean, like, not personally, we're aware of him, but yeah. yeah. So, like, what he does is, I think, you know, is super cool, and it's it's maybe more more uh, vintage correct than I want to be. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. But I respect what he's doing. It's yeah. it's really cool. So, so my Folsom is maybe, you know, it's a nod. With, it's a modern nod. Know, yeah. You know. So, like, his is more of a more of a copy of a Bigsby with his own style. Yeah. Mine is less of a copy of a Bigsby. With well, it, and it yeah. makes sense because the people who he's making that stuff for, like everything they do has to be period correct. That correct. Exactly. Like, right. Yeah. Their lives are about the period correctness. About Right. Kind of yeah. Stuff. So I'm more loosely nodding to it versus <laughs> yes. totally committing to it. <laughs> Only boots if they've been made by somebody's hands kind of thing. You know? <laughs> so on that same line, I noticed that you are now the keeper of the R.C. Allen uh, yeah, uh, molds. I guess they're te- technically yeah. molds. They and, are molds. Yeah, and uh, I think you procured those through Deke Dickerson, who yep. is, is is one of those guys that, that likes the TK <laughs> yep. Smith stuff, without a doubt. Tony, um, you're 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 doing some deep cuts here, baby. What are you ta- what get enlighten us? So R.C. Allen was a uh, 1940s 1950s. Uh, guitar pioneer in California who worked alongside with Paul Bigsby and uh, uh, Semi Mosley. I mean, everybody. I mean, in the in the California guitar world, he was he was you know um, among the top. And uh, he, uh, in reading you know some of the info on Barry's site, I saw that he is now the the keeper of of the R.C. Allen molds. So can you give us a little more uh, more detail on those? Yeah, so so RC built all he was a guitar builder for so long. He built all kinds of things over the course of his career. He built banjos and acoustic guitars and just tons of things. Uh, but what I have are his molds for making arch tops. Mm-hmm. So I actually am able to hand laminate um, arched plates. Um, so like you know like a like a 335 or a Gibson ES5, right? That's actually, a, you might call it a plywood guitar. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. but plywood's kind of a, a coarse term. Um, you know, you're taking veneers and putting them in a form with some glue and creating uh, creating arch tops. And um, so I do build on a custom basis arch tops for folks. And um, it's, you know, most of the people who want them kind of dig the fact that, you know, there you can get a custom made arch top uh, by somebody like me for almost factory arch top prices. Uh, I mean, not to say that I'm selling these cheap, but you know, some of the custom shop prices are getting pretty stiff these days. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and, uh, and these have a kind of a unique sound and to the people who knew who R.C. Allen was, it's cool to be able to get something made from his tooling. Um, and so, you know, the, the instruments themselves, there's various sizes, 15 inch, 16, 17, even 18 inch arch tops that I have molds for. Um, and these are kind of in the neighborhood of like a, like a Gretsch 6120 or a Gibson, um, 175. I mean, none of them are exactly those instruments, but that's the kind of thing that mm -hmm. I can make from yeah. these molds. Um, and uh, I probably build, I probably build four or five of those a year on a custom basis. Wow, that's um, a, that's impressive. I was going to say yeah. one or two a year would probably be a pretty major undertaking. Yeah, it's I, I, you know I probably I probably don't build any more than like six custom guitars a year. Like I mean fully custom, like a steel string flat top acoustic or a nylon string acoustic or an arch top guitar. Um so super custom stuff and then the rest of it is more of the standard stuff, like highly customized, but standard, right? right. Like, like I can make a Mendocino in eight weeks and we can change the color and we can do the binding and we can make the neck fatter or skinnier, whatever you want, you know, eight weeks, pretty much reliably. But these custom things like the arch tops are like a year and a half waiting list. Wow. Um, yep. Cause I, I, although I have help in the shop, um, I don't have help on those, right? They're kind of too custom. So those are just made by me. That's really cool. And with the with the vintage uh, lineage, it, that just makes the instrument even that much cooler. Yeah, it's made of unobtainium ish <laughs> stuff. <laughs> well, Barry, this has been a, a ton of fun learning about your awesome guitars and um, the craft and the care that you put into them, uh, which is so clearly evident the minute you you put your hands on one. Well, I appreciate that very much. You bet. Um, we are going to transition now into the the uh beloved uh, <laughs> much section beloved. of our show uh, <laughs> unless you're trying to come up with one <laughs> <laughs> yeah hey and everybody's like what are they always moaning about coming up with the would you rather you know we've now this is the 316th well maybe not 316th but uh, pretty dang close to that Hmm. Uh, would you rather? So, <laughs> help us out. Yeah, like, send us some please. in. Because <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to get tired and dusty. You know, we want to. We want to keep it fresh. Strange. Yeah, and we got a couple people helping us out all the time. But you know, we need they. Yes. We need to give them a break too. Absolutely. So, Todd, as you alluded to, we've come to the part of the show. Everyone's favorite part oh, of the show. Yes. Everyone writes in droves about how much they love this part of yes. the show. It's a little game we like think, to play. Think the Christmas story A plus. A plus. <laughs> a plus, plus, a plus. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little game we like to play called a Would You Rather. Yes. I think you either go flat on purpose or you just, that's your jam. Anyways, go ahead. Yeah, a little pitchy dog. Yeah. Um, so this week's Would You Rather, this is, an, this is a combination Would You Rather history lesson. Uh, because uh, just recently, in fact, uh, yesterday, um, the uh, world's record for number of guitarists in one place uh, was set. Uh, it was led by Steve Vai and my personal favorite, Michelangelo Batio, um, in Poland, of all places. And they had 7,968 guitar players playing uh, the Jimi Hendrix version of Hey Joe. Oh, I thought you were going to say putting in a light bulb. Uh, well, yeah. How many guitars does it take to change a light bulb? Yeah. 7,968, yeah, apparently. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of a cool thing. Um, and, you know, maybe next year there'll be 7,969. Yeah. So let me give you a little history on Hey Joe. Because everyone thinks it was a Hendrix song, right? I don't think it was. Well, I'm glad you don't, Todd, because <laughs> you'd be dead wrong. Yeah, no, actually, I did hear some about this. Um, so, uh, Joe brief, was a real person. Well, I'm not. Even, it might very well be. It, no. it stems from um, in in 1962. The song was copyrighted by uh, an American song singer songwriter in England uh, called Billy Roberts. 
Um, in 1965-66, Tim Rose was playing his version of Hey Joe in, uh, in New York City. Yeah. And uh, even before Hendrix recorded it, uh, they did, they were the band. He was doing it Rat Pack style, though, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. Hey, Joe, I mean, where you going with that? Well, gun no, in your Hendrix. Hand Hendrix there. version is slower than most of the other versions. Like there were the Safaris recorded it before Hendrix oh. did. Mm. Uh, Love the band recorded mm. it. The Birds did a version of it before Hendrix recorded it. And um, so uh, apparently, in around sixty five, sixty six, Jimmy was hanging out at uh, at Cafe Wa. In, uh, I've Greenwich. been there. Yeah, I've been there too, in Greenwich Village. And he heard Tim Rose do this song, and he started doing it. He was, at that time, in 1966, it was Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so here's your Would You Rather. A genie magically appears. Ah, the old genie. And the genie has a time machine. The purple genie. Yes. The big purple genie. The big purple genie. With the, with the turban. With the fez. Yes. yes. No fez. He doesn't wear This no. genie wears the, the turban, turban. Yeah, okay. with the big ruby in the middle. Gotcha. Um, so he appears and says, you look like a decent guitar player. <laughs> and I say, well, okay, yeah, maybe. Or yeah. you might be saying, yeah, of course I All am. Right. Of course I am. Of course Don't I am. Don't insult me. Um, he says, I'm going to give you one of two wishes. Grant you okay. one of two wishes. Yeah. The first is I'm going to send you to Poland, and you can play. And Steve Vai is going to call you up on stage, so you and Steve and Michelangelo Badio, who has the two neck guitars, uh, geez, that thing. Yes, that's the one. He, you're going to play on stage with them, leading this s almost nearly eight thousand guitar players yes. playing. Hey Joe. What's option C? <laughs> <laughs> or I can send you back to 1966. Uh -huh. And you're going to be in Cafe Wa listening to Tim Rose play his version. But who's going to walk in and stand right next to you? Jimmy James, a.k.a. Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix. Hendrix. So those are your two choices. You could be on stage with Shred Central, setting the new world record, or you could be back in 1966 and finding the same song, listening to the same song that Jimi Hendrix would later re-record. Okay, so you kind of have a Super Bowl moment, kind of. Super Bowl moment, yeah. Yeah. yeah by, You're on three, setting the world record. Yeah. In front of thousands, nay, millions. Yeah, well, okay. Whoever watched it. Yes, I yeah. watched it. Yeah. Or... And in the company of, of uh, truly a fantastic guitar player, Steve yes. I. Yes, and Michelangelo yeah, Badio. But mostly Steve I. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. you're in a rather intimate setting. Yeah. At Cafe Wa. Yeah. With a question mark. Yeah. And uh, you're, you're, you're standing there listening to this... Strange version of Hey Joe that you don't really recognize. Yes, because but, it hadn't been made yet. But Jimmy James walks in. Yeah. So what's it going to be, boy? Okay. Well, we start with you, Tan Tanya. So oh. Go ahead. Uh, I guess I have to put my other hat on. Hold yes. on. Um, I think. Oh man, see, I love going to Poland. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this is really about. When I when I when I was in in Warsaw, I need or not in Warsaw, I, I, in Krakow. We found we, we met these this, these college students and ended up going back to their dorm. And on the way there, there was a twenty four hour. He'll find his way back, Barry. It's cool. Twenty four hour <laughs> pierogi house. Twenty four hours, okay. and and you could get a maybe not. You can get a dozen pierogi. For I think the equivalent was like three or four. You only bucks. need one pierogi because uh, everyone oh. tastes exactly the same. Oh no 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 no, uh, no 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 no! All contraire, Pierre. Uh, so that was that. I mean, it's uh, it's pierogies and Michael Patio. <laughs> really? That's what you. That's what you're giving me. No, I think I'm going to go back in time, and back in the '66. Yes, and just to be able to rub shoulders with Jimmy James. 
I think would be extremely cool. So as much as I love going to Poland and setting world records, I, I think... But mostly going to Poland, <laughs> yeah, apparently. Okay. All right. Gotcha. That's what I'm going with. I got with. you loud and clear. All right, Barry... Yeah, without hesitation, going back in time. Poland sounds awesome, but not with 7,000 guitar players. <laughs> Nearly 8,000. <000. laughs> Nearly 8,000. I mean, maybe on stage, all right, no. He just went to yeah. NAM. Why on <laughs> earth would he want <laughs> I don't need, well, need 7,000 more. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, Tony, this Hang. is a, you just want everybody on your island this time, finally. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not even a remotely... <laughs> A, a would I rather kind of thing. It's uh that yeah, but you yeah. can be making history. Uh, I'm, but I wouldn't be making history. Steve Vai is making history. Well, but you're standing right next to Steve. Yeah, but I'm just getting whipped in the face by his coattail things <laughs> that are flying around, and <laughs> I don't, you know, being poked in the head with Badio's crazy guitar. I have nope. That's a that's a big hard negative for me. Oh, okay. yeah, man. I'll just sit in Cafe One yeah. and snap and That's cool, be cool, man. baby. Hey, Joe, where you going with that gun yeah. in your hand? Uh, anyways, all right. So that was a moderately entertaining one. Thank you, Tony. I just wanted to add a little <laughs> color. It uh, wasn't the best would you rather of all time, but, no, but I mean. But it got us through it. It got us to the next but, one. But you saw the imagery. I did. I was there with you. You could imagine it. Yes. Looking for somewhere different to eat. So, um. <laughs> Barry, we need to say thanks to a handful of people, and we then we'll get you uh, uh, on your way. How about that? I'll sit tight. Perfect. That's right, Todd, because at this point of the show, yes. there's a special group of people we love to thank. These are our executive producers. Now, what's an executive producer? Well, an executive producer makes this show possible. How do you become one? Go over to pick, <laughs> pickguardian.com? No. <laughs> <laughs> Later, you can go there. But first, go to patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs. Check out a couple different levels in which you can participate. Become a sponsor, a patron of this very podcast. Each level comes with some very nice thank you gifts. But as an executive producer, there's one more thing. Jared, what is that? You get to have your name written on the thing. Nicely done, Todd. I don't think Jared would be upset with you for doing that. Oh, no, he wouldn't. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Read these fine, fine sponsors, patrons of the podcast. That's right. <laughs> Moon Guitars, Vader and Pedals, John Halverson. Rick Calhoun, Trevor Gunberg, Elad Mizrahi, Mike D, mm. Richard Kendall, Mark Garten, Matt Hart, James White, Justin Jones, Anthony Gemalero, Bill Gola Guitars, John Esterly, Anthony Lathrop, Stefan Lamb, Michael Senchuk, Ken Sayers, Doug Christ, Darren Gregory, Tom Brazen, Rusty Sneeden, Ralph Gottschalk, Don Kloss, Gregory Randall, Brett Hogarth, Eric Hemmer, Stuart George, Michael Furman, James Bell, James Romer, Cameron Pampas, and new this week, a new executive producer, David Tyndall. Indeed. Welcome yes. aboard. You are in very good company, my friend. Yes. That is 100% true. Ah, but, but Todd, Todd, yes. Todd, Todd, there's another okay. group of executive producers. We like to call them our grand poobas. These fine folks get a fez to wear upon their hell, their hell, uh, their heads whilst listening to the podcast. Mm, and at, and the, at same the same time. time. So uh, special, special, special thanks to these grand poobas. Tommy Manasco, Ricardo Igareda, David Kaminga. Brandon Wound Pickups, Hex Matos, Michio Murakishi, Bob Crouch, Jack Cadian, Sam Jett, Tyler Rines, LSJ Music Company, John Williams, James Pennington, Adam Johnson, Steve Keys, Cody Foster, Science of Sound, Brian Robison, Jonathan Jerusik, Corey Nigro, Michael Van Zant, Tim Nowak, Jonathan Daly, Martin Cliff, Sean S. S. David Poe, Billy Spitfire Unlimited, Congregation Gear Demos, Paul Van Eppinger, 
Scott Sullivan, and Great Lakes Guitar Pickups. Indeed, thank indeed. Thank you, thank you. We really do appreciate that. Um, and you know, we got some, we got some really nice things thrown our way for the the seventh year kind of thing that we did. And and honestly, guys, we can't do this without you. Uh, uh, we would not be here without your help. Truly, um, we love doing it. But there are, you know, there are things that uh, just allow us to keep doing this. Yes. Um, so. That being said, we need to say a humongous thank you to Barry, Grez Guitars. Thank you, Barry, for joining our show and enlightening us about these amazing instruments you make and the stories behind it. Oh, thanks, guys. Where can people go to get these said things? GrezGuitars.com. Perfect. Tony. Yes? Where can people get a fancy pick guard? Well, after you go to Patreon.com, head over to PickGuardian.com yes. and check out some of the things that I do. Uh, there's some things you can buy right there on the site, but by and large, uh, I do custom work. So shoot me an email. Let me know what you're trying to do. And I, uh, who knows, I might have a suggestion for you. I guarantee you will. Uh, we Billy had to uh, slip out. He's got some family stuff going on. Uh, so unfortunately, he didn't get to finish our, our show with us. But uh, you can shoot me an email, Todd, at theguitarnobs.com or DM me on Instagram, at guitarnobs. We'd love to hear from you. Um, tell us what you think of the show. Share your would you rather so you don't have to listen to Polish... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> trips. You wait till stuff. the next time. Yeah, we're gonna have uh, a pierogi guitar. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah, please, please uh, reach out and just uh, you know, we pick up the phone. We are, we do honestly ask any of the other people that do. Anyhow, uh, thank you all for joining us for the show. Thank you to Barry. Have a fantastic guitar week and subscribe. Yeah. Wait, what are you talking about? The new collection. Wait, what? Boy, you are. You got to know better than to try to get Billy mid-turn. You had me in the moment, Tony. (laughs) Billy is the exception to the exception. I I don't know what you're talking about. The enchilada. (laughs) Damn it. Ah, yes. All right. Um, We're doing some happy fun times here. Say hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Perfect. Hey. (laughs) So Billy, uh, who you met at the show with me, um, he was the one who looked lost a lot. Um, (laughs) (laughs) In Guitarland, there are never enough distractions, eh? Uh, Barry. (laughs) Ah, Barry. (laughs) I love Barry. Yeah. I mean, come on, guys. It's the way we have to do these things. (laughs) It's business. Yeah. I'm I'm, I'm building. This show is about builders of boutique things that's true that's and true unique thing and unique modification you must I'm, have, I'm in the unique modifications did listen, department did you listen to the last podcast <laughs> he finally found out what we do <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. oh my answer is still gear eventually the yeah, Germans yeah, yeah. then yeah. they must be talking about the Germans <laughs> if you were uh, Eastern European you'd say Zhebik Zhebik yeah, my last name yeah. is Novak so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm right there. I'm American is Dudzik. I'm actually a Dudzik. Dudzik. There you Dudzik go. Novak yeah. and Grezbik. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the wow. G-R-Z apparently is one sound. It's a... Wow. Grez- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you haven't seen Barry? No, it's on HBO, right? Yeah, it yeah. is. It's, Somebody uh, was just telling me about it. It oh is fantastic. Yes. It is a killer show. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> waka waka. You're fine. You're fine. Just go about yourself. And away we go. Well, that's it for these knobs. Please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs. Visit our website at theguitarnobs.com for all of our past episodes, four on the floor blog and other good stuff. You can connect with us on social too at our Facebook page and share your gear and stories on our Facebook group. Also, be sure to check out our Instagram at Guitar Knobs. Catch you next time.